<coughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the ninth session of Statistically Speaking. We started with eight lectures on more or less basic topics in biostatistics. And now, uh, with these last four, we're taking on some more advanced topics that reflect tools that people use very frequently uh, across uh, lots of kind, kinds of experiments. So last week, we talked about principal component analysis. This week, we're going to talk about clustering. And uh, I've called it agglomerative versus divisive clustering. But uh, these, these terms have uh, another name. That would be the lumpers and the splitters. So we're, we're going to talk about these algorithms in that context. <laughs> All right, he doesn't like the tripod. That's OK. We'll just move straight ahead. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the need for clustering, why people end up using it. So discovering the relationships among samples. We're going to talk about distance metrics, which is kind of an underappreciated area that we must discuss. Um, the, the way that we decide which samples are most similar to each other. From there, we'll talk about this distinction between agglomerative uh, and divisive clustering. We'll talk about one of the outputs that we frequently see from these, uh, from these uh, clustering attempts called a dendrogram. And we will talk a little bit about an underappreciated fellow from uh, the 20th century uh, in statistics uh, who was associated with, uh, with, who came out of the uh, Swedish statistical community named Tor Delinius. So let us move straight ahead. Uh, we're going to start with why bother? Why, why is it that clustering shows up so frequently in biological experiments? Uh, and the first is that it enables us to discover the relationships among our data. So uh, a dendrogram may give us a nested sample relationship, a, a nested sample relationship diagram, which is to say that you may find that these two samples are most similar to each other, and then outside that we see another two samples are similar to each other, and then at, an, at a higher level, those pairs of samples are in fact like each other. So that, that's what nested means, that we have relationships inside relationships. Okay, so the sample structure may be something that we can infer based on the data produced by our samples. So maybe we had some notion of how our, our, our experimental data should relate to each other, but maybe that model that we had in our mind for what the data should look like does not actually reflect what the, the true data are like. So uh, if, if, the, if the data have a different story to tell than your presumption in how you designed the experiment, clustering is one of the ways that you can find that out. Now, uh, I, I should remind everybody, if you don't have a copy of the slides on your computer yet, uh, there's a link uh, by, on the, the YouTube video corresponding to this that lets you jump directly to a Google folder that has both the statistical script that we're going to follow in the demo and uh, the, the PDF of these slides. So you should have access to that already. All right. So maybe you have a vision of how your samples relate to each other that does not really reflect what the data from them uh, has to tell us. So uh, the other thing is that you might be able to find samples that actually have the wrong labels associated with them. What if you were doing a study of tuberculosis in the community, for example, and the, the set of people that you, had, you uh, had labeled as controls, people without tuberculosis, well, some of them actually had subclinical tuberculosis, and in the course of the study, they developed tuberculosis. Suddenly, a sample that should have been a control, nominally, is actually a case. So clustering is, is going to find these relationships based on what the data have to tell us, not our assertions about the data. OK, so I've, uh, I've given a little example here of an experimental hierarchy. It's a pretty simple one. At the top, I have a bunch of controls. At the bottom, I have a bunch of cases. In each case, I have two biological replicates. Imagine that this is five. It doesn't much matter. Here we've got biological one and biological two for the cases, and biological one and biological two for the controls. And then maybe we're a little concerned about the variability of our technology. So we've run technical replicates where the same sample is introduced to the instrument multiple times. And we see that we have multiple technical replicates coming from biological one, multiple technical replicates coming from biological two, et cetera. Now this is not a cluster. This is an experimental design. So if we have produced these 12 data files from these 12 experiments, we presume, based on how the experiment was designed, that the data are going to bear some relationships. So um, in this experiment, which samples should be most similar? 
in looking at this diagram, which ones would you expect to be most similar? The duplicates of biological one, the duplicates of each biological one. Of each biological one, right. So we have a set of three technical replicates that have been produced from each of the biological replicates. So just based on the design, we expect that these three files will have high relationship to each other. These three files will have a strong relationship to each other. Those yellow ones will have uh, a strong relationship to each other, and those blue ones will have a strong relationship to each other. So because of the design, we anticipate that kind of relationship. If clustering were to reveal a different relationship among those data files, maybe technical two of biological one of the cases was a, a failed experiment, for example, we would want to know that, wouldn't we? So clustering can help us to find these relationships and ensure that they, in fact, represent how the, design, how the experiment was designed. OK, uh, next, this is an example of a nested set of relationships in that even if these three technicals are the most similar to each other or these three technicals are the same, have a strong relationship to each other, we also expect that the next layer up, we also have a set of relationships. That the, the, the technicals from biological one and the technicals from biological two within the cases are quite likely to relate to each other. So they don't just relate to each other within these very narrow sets, the fact that these are all leaves off of the same, uh, the same branch. We also expect at a higher level to see these relationships in place. So that's why we talk about nested relationships. All right. So if we infer a hierarchy based on data, we should see something about how these experiments were designed in the first place. If they don't um, bear that relationship, that's a problem. So if, if we see that control biological replica two uh, actually ends up being a case rather than a control, then suddenly we've got this problem where uh, a, a branch has moved out of place, something's a little squirrely with our data. So clustering is gonna give us the ability to recognize these relationships. Now, how do we decide whether samples are the same or different. So for the purposes of this, let us assume that we are measuring, um, let us say, 40 transcripts for uh, genes believed to be related to this case versus control difference, okay? So I want you to imagine that we have columns that represent individual samples, and we have rows that represent genes. We said, how many, 40? 40 genes. So this table of our data uh, gives us measurements on 40 different genes for each of our patients. Grant, so how do we decide which of these pairs of samples are most like each other? What would that mean in the context of our table uh, what, to form these distances? It means that we have these columns representing different samples, and we're trying to compare one particular pairing of columns, this one and this one, and we have a, a set of 40 numbers for each of these samples. So now we need to be able to say, are these two close together or are they far apart? So uh, there are lots of ways that people go about doing this. And here I've given you just four. Um, the one that you always hear about is the Euclidean distance, but there are lots of different ways to do this. So let's start with the Manhattan distance. This is uh, kind of a nickname for this one. Um, it, if you were driving from point A to point B in New York City, uh, you, can't, you can't drive as the, as the crow flies, right? I mean, it, the, if you look at the, the distance in the air between two spots in Manhattan, that has nothing to do with how far you're going to have to drive to get from one to the other. So the Manhattan distance between two points uh, is asking in each of these 40 genes that we've measured, each of those is something like a different dimension how far do we have to drive to get from uh, gene one measurement to gene one measurement in the other sample? How far do we have to drive to get from uh, gene two's measurement to gene two's measurement in the second sample? And we add up all of those distances. Does everyone see that? So in the, in the mathematical language, we would say that the distance is equal to the sum of the absolute values of each of these distances in each of those 40 dimensions, each of those 40 genes that we've measured. All clear so far? 
Okay, that one's pretty much the easiest of them. So we ask how different are they on gene one, how different are they on gene two, how different are they on gene three, and we add them all up. That's what the sum of the sigma means. Okay, so that's the easy one. Now, let's talk next about Euclidean distance. Um, back when you took geometry in high school, you probably remember the teacher going on quite a lot about right triangles and how you would figure out in a right triangle, if you knew side A's length and side B's length, how you would determine the, the length of side C in a right <coughs> triangle. And that's the Pythagorean theorem. You square the, the length of A, you square the length of B, you add those together, take the square root, and that gives you the length of side C. Everyone remembers that? Yep. Great. Okay. So, uh, we do something similar in this multivariate space of 40 different genes. <coughs> in each case, we're going to ask what is the distance between the measurement for gene 1 and the measurement for gene 1 in the two samples. That's a side of a, a right triangle of sorts. We square that, that difference. And we add to that the square of the difference for gene 2, and the square of the distance for gene 3, the square of the distance for gene 4. And once we've summed all of those together, we take the square root. That gives us this distance. Now, I'm going to try to explain why that's legit. If we had only two measurements for each gene, uh, sorry, for each sample, rather, you could plot on an XY plot that sample one had this, this measurement for gene one and this measurement for gene two and put a little X there. And then you could do the same for the other sample. And finding the distance on this xy plot for just two genes, the distance, the Euclidean distance, like a, by, by a Pythagorean theorem, would tell you how far apart they were in just those two genes. So what we're doing is extending that to a third gene. Imagine a third dimension added to our graph, or a fourth, <coughs> gene, a fourth dimension to our graph, and so on, until finally we were able to get up to our full list of 40 genes that we wanted to measure on. Because you can treat the expression levels of each of these 40 genes as a coordinate, as, as a, a distance along an axis to give us a coordinate in space representing that one sample. All right, so that, that was a little, a little head trippy, but I want you to remember that this all makes sense on the 2D plane and on a 3D volume, and that it keeps making sense as we add up 40 dimensions. So that's why we use the same formula for Pythagorean theorem in this context of a great many dimensions. All right, that gets us to Chebyshev. Now, Chebyshev is uh, it, it, it's a simple notion again, but its effects can be rather important. So here, we're going to ask, for which gene did we have the biggest difference between these two samples? And only that biggest gene change is going to represent the distance between the two. So this is kind of a pessimistic analysis, right? If you have two samples that had exactly the same measurement for 39 genes, and for the 40th gene they had a really big difference, Chebyshev is going to punish the heck out of that thing and say, only the biggest difference counts in deciding how similar these two samples are. So you can see this is already quite different than what we, what we saw above with the Euclidean distance. All right, and finally we're going to get down to something that we see frequently, uh, especially when we deal with information scientists. Uh, so if you're reading a paper that's been touched by a computer scientist, you might see a KL distance, a kolbeck liebler distance. And here we are taking the, uh, the measurements for this sample and multiplying them by the logarithm of this measurement divided by the measurement in the other sample. Now that one's a little hard to explain with geometry and I'm not really going to try, but this is one of the ways that we use to describe something called entropy kind of the amount of disorder that you have within, within the information system. So if, if we're talking about the mutual information of two samples, something like kolbeck liebler probably makes more sense than, than working with something like uh, the Euclidean distance. Now, if you really thought the subject was fascinating, I, su I suggest you take a look at this paper from 2007, which will submerge you in upwards of 30 different metrics that people use for computing the distance between two samples. So obviously, you're not limited to just do things the Euclidean way. There are lots of different options, and they can all be appropriate in the right circumstance. Okay, on we go. So, um, I've mentioned before that we've got the lumpers and the splitters, that we have the, uh, the agglomerative uh, 
uh, clustering approaches and then device clustering approaches. And we're going to talk about uh, each of these. So I, I, I want you to keep in mind that there are no uh, that, that there are many different ways to come to the same answer essentially. So in a, uh, I've always uh, kind of liked the word glom as as a verb. You know, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna glom the bill for uh, travel uh, between the ho uh, between the hotel and the conference site to my bill for uh, for taking part in a conference, for example, glomming to to stick something onto another. So in agglomerative clustering. We are sticking together data points to build clusters. In the divisive approach, we are instead trying to partition a big group of things into smaller groups of things that make more sense. Now, there are, uh, there are a lot of different ways that we talk about uh, how, how we optimize the div division of a large group into another. If you were trying to subdivide uh, 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 the, the students in a class uh, based on height or something like that, you might ask uh, for a, a random grouping of, of students. Have you have you got a relatively uniform height? Have you got a relatively um, diverse set of heights? Right. So there there are lots of different metrics that we use for this. One one term that we see uh, in information science is something called Gini impurity that asks how much uh, diversity we have in groups after we've done a split. Because ideally, if you're, if you're trying to split up a big group of people into two groups of people that are more similar to each other, you want to see that, they're, that having made a split, you've actually improved matters, not, not worsened them. Okay, so uh, let's, let's kind of walk through this. Imagine that we had, did we ever say how many patients we had? We said we had 40 different genes we were measuring. Let's, let's say we have 20 people, right? So 20 people, 40 missions. So now, I'm going to start with 20 clusters, each one hosting one person. So the committee of one. You know, the one person is, is a, a, an individual cluster here. Next, I need to build up, I need to glom together clusters. So I look for which two, uh, two clusters I have in hand that are most similar to each other, and I glom them together. Okay, so I'm going to stick, I, I, before I had 20 people and 20 clusters. After this first glomming, I now have 19 clusters because one of those clusters has two people in it. Then I repeat until all of the clusters have been joined. So I'm going to keep track of the order in which I group these together. In the first case, person number three and person number seven were most similar, so I have glommed those together. Now I have 19 clusters left. So I have another 18 steps I have to go before all of them have been joined together, and I'm going to remember that order. Okay, so this is the hierarchical agglomerative clustering approach. You might sometimes see the abbreviation HAC, H-A-C, to represent that. That's fine. So this is uh, something that we see implemented as the H-clust function uh, within, uh, within R. We'll, we'll be using that at the end. Now, in the divisive approach, we're, we're starting with a big group of everything, and we're trying to figure out the most logical ways to chop to produce this into a, a set of, of clusters. So, to begin, we have just one cluster, of one pool of all of these samples, and we're trying to figure out where to cut it. We use some rule to slice that, the, that cluster in half. Now we have two clusters, and we're going to repeat until all of the points are clusters. So this is exactly the same as this uh, approach at the left, except instead of uh, glomming everything together, we're cutting it apart. So that both of these approaches are, are useful. Uh, they're, not, they're not used in exactly the same context, and we'll try to see what that would be. Okay, so um, remember we talked about distances. Those distances come into play when we're trying to decide in an agglomerative approach which one, which one should be joined next. So we start with this uh, complete uh, term. Now, these, uh, complete linkage means that what we care about is the maximum distance that we have between things. So here I've simulated some data. I've got the code in the script for how we generated this figure. I have five black items, and I have five red items. And so now I'm going to talk about what is the linkage between these groups. So in complete linkage, I could compute uh, the distance between any pair of points drawing from drawing one black in and one red in. Okay? So for do I have a stick in here? Did that one vanish? I think it's I think it's gone. That's very sad. 
I use the water bottle though. I just have to do. So uh, you could imagine that I start by selecting this black point just by random chance. And I can compute its distance to this red, to this red, to this red, to this red, and to this red. Five different distances because here we have a five on five comparison. Then I can choose the next black item and, and choose its distance to each of the five red points. So all told, I have five black points, five red points. How many total dis distances can I compute there? Each black point can associate with each red point. And there are five of each. 25, exactly. So this, this is a really simple case. Each red against each black gives us 25 different points of comparison. I ask what is the maximum one of those if I'm using a complete linkage approach. And we see that in this case it's 4.05, uh, 4 which corresponds to this black point all the way up here and this red point all the way down here. That distance gives us a 4.05 here. Now, single uh, is a much more optimistic way to look at how similar these groups are. It asks how close do they get to brushing each other, essentially. What, what, are the, what are the points that are most proximal to each other from cluster A and cluster B? So in this case, maybe drawing a line from this black point to this red point is a much shorter distance than the most far-flung members of those two groups. And that gives us a value of 1.51. So if you see the terms complete and single linkage, you can just substitute in your head maximum and minimum. When you get to mean, Suddenly, we really do have to compute all of these 25 distances because each of them is going to contribute to some mean distance between the two groups. So we compute all 25, we compute the mean of them, and now we've got our mean distance of 2.86. But there's another way to compute this medium distance between the groups, and that is a centroid approach. Here, we're going to compute only one distance, but we're going to do it between values that are not really observed directly. So for these five black points, we can compute the average x value, and we can compute the average y value. And you see I've drawn in this, this white circle, oh, sorry, the black, a black circle and a red circle down below. Those represent the centroid, the centroid of these, of these clusters. So the centroid is not a data point, really. It's derived from all the data points in that cluster. So having decided that the middle of all the black points is this black circle, and the middle of all these red points is this red circle, I compute the distance from the black centroid to the red centroid, and now I have a centroid distance. And that is 2.82. <clears throat> As you might expect, the, the mean distance between data, data point pairs and the, mean, and, and the distance between the centroids is very, very similar to each other but you'll sometimes see one used in preference to the other. Okay, so these are all different ways that we can judge what linkage is best in comparing, in building our clusters. All right, now graphically, I think it's a little easier to begin understanding this if we, if we kind of imagine how this unfolds. I start with these five data points, and now we're going to agglomeratively build a cluster of them all. So I'm, the, the, the formula, the, the algorithm we're going to follow is that we're going to ask what pair of these points can, uh, is most similar to each other. All right, well, we think this pair is probably closest, and we know that pair is very close as well. So we see that uh, in the first step, maybe we join these two together and say, these are now a cluster. <clears throat> these two points are relatively close together, they get, they get combined together as well. So we kind of skipped uh, visualizing the step where one of these got picked first, but it doesn't much matter. Now, what, is, what cluster is most similar to each other, or what clusters are most similar to each other once we reach this stage? What we see is that this, this singleton is quite close to this cluster in what's left. And so we can next draw our circle around these, and now we have two clusters instead of three. Because remember, this still counts as a cluster, even though it has just one item in it. And so finally, we have only two clusters remaining, and we draw a circle around all of those, and now we've got our cluster of everything. So that's the, that's the process as we iterate through joining together the nearest neighbors. Nearest neighbors is a term that shows up an awful lot, so uh, that's a good term to, to have uh, committed to memory. Nearest neighbors is, is an evaluation of 
which uh, remaining clusters are most close to each other, are closest to each other, I should probably that apologize there. Okay, so, um, we, because this approach is always looking for what is the strongest relationship to, uh, to draw a link by, a, a link through in, in, for the next stage, we would sometimes call this a greedy algorithm. Now, a greedy algorithm is kind of a, it's, it's a bit of a, a slur in, in the computer science world because if you create a greedy algorithm, you've created one that runs very quickly um, that gives a pretty good result, but it doesn't give the provably best result. So clustering is another one of these algorithms that we use because it's something that gives good results, not necessarily optimal results. We're not going to fuss too much about that. Now, uh, along the way, we have developed uh, we, we have developed this dendrogram in companion to this. Here we started with one, two, three, four, five points. Here we have one, two, three, four, five points. And this diagram is going to reflect each of these joins that we've done at each step. So we saw that points one and two, oh, sorry, I guess these, we'll call these four and five, that four and five were most similar to each other. And so we see that the hook that connects the two of them together is, uh, is, is closest to the bottom. In the second stage, we connected together these two points. I think they're calling them one and two. So one and two were the second connection that we made in this graph. Then we glommed in the third point here to the cluster from one and two. So here we see that we've got our third join. And finally, for the fifth join, we merged together this group and this group to create one cluster of them all. So you can see that this ordering, this, this cartoon of, of different cells, cell, cell, is, is captured by this joining diagram. And this order of joins in the hierarchical clustering approach and the agglomerative approach is, is capturing the, the series of decisions we made about which ones get joined together. Everyone good with that? All right. Now, I have a nasty, tricky question here at, uh, underneath that dendrogram. How many clusters should I claim from this plot? So what we have is, is that cut tree has been applied here. The cut was applied at level six. And at level six, we see that this, this, and this are treated as separate clusters. Grant. So from the diagram, it's apparent that we have decided to cut at six, which, which gives us three different clusters. Everyone sees that? All right. How many clusters do I have if I cut at three? At three on the y-axis. Four. That's right. What we have is an arbitrary decision here. Because if I chop at six, I get three different groups. If I chop at three, I get one, two, three, four different groups. So what we have is something of an arbitrary decision. And if you have to make a decision in your research that's arbitrary, you really hope that no one on your committee asks you about it. Because it's really kind of hard to defend that, well, it looked right. OK, so when we have a dendrogram like this, what we would like to see is some really long stretches where you've just got verticals. There's no additional branching. Because generally speaking, in these diagrams, we'll see that how far these verticals stretch has something to say about how tightly related the members are beneath it. So how those distances get set is, is going to be treated as outside the scope of this, uh, this commentary today. But we'll, we'll look at some diagrams that will uh, reveal this to us. OK. So let us then talk about k-means clustering. k-means clustering is one of those algorithms that, when you first see it, it might seem so blatantly ignorant that it couldn't possibly work. But somehow, it seems to. And people use it a lot. So if you are using k-means, um, you're, you're using a very standard approach in the field of clustering. Now, we've, we've changed. We were talking about agglomerative clustering, where we were sticking together clusters to make bigger ones. Now we're talking about divisive clustering. So we need to provide two inputs every time we make use of k-means clustering. And the first of them 
is the answer to that question we just asked on the previous slide. How many clusters do we have? So you may say, in this study, I'm dealing with cases and I'm dealing with controls. So I should have all of my patients falling into two clusters, cases and controls. That would be kind of a starting point for k-means clustering. The other thing that you must provide is n, the number of starting positions. So in the United States around Memorial Day, we had this big race called the ND500, and we're all you know, pumped for one day, exactly one day about Formula One racing. Um, so you imagine that where the cars started this race was decided by random numbers. You know, we had 200 entrants, oh, probably not that many, maybe 40 entrants, and all 40 entrants, we, we just kept flipping coins to decide who got to go first and who, who, was, uh, who was in the first row of cars and who was in the second row of cars and who was in the third row of cars. It's kind of crazy, right? So you might imagine that the people who started the race in the front ranks were at an advantage compared to those in the back of the, in the, back of the, the ranks, just because, the, because their starting positions were so different. So, what if we ran that same race 20 times, each time changing randomly where people appeared in the starting order? Now we're going to get a, a, more uh, a fairer appraisal of who's the best race driver. You know, somebody who can win the Indy 500 starting from all the way at the back is, is a pretty hot driver, right? So, um, in the same way, we're going to start this clustering process many, many times. In this case, uh, let's say 20 is many, many, right? So we've, we start from uh, the set of all data points 20 different times. And for each of those 20 different starts, we're going to assign random labels to all of our data points. So if you have some, uh, some rule on how many you expect by random chance, you could feed this to the software saying 60% of my data are controls and 40% of my data are cases. And so at the starting line, 60% of them would be set to one and 40% would be set to the other. But which samples get which label is set randomly. Randomly. So we're going to just start by calling these A's and these B's and that's it. Well, based on nothing. <clears throat> okay, so having created a random classification of samples into the A's, B's, and C's, for example, we then ask, what is the centroid for each group? Well, isn't that kind of nonsensical? Right? We started by applying random labels to these data points, and now we're asking, what's the centroid for all of these randomly assigned groups? Well, that's what we've done. So we, we then compute those centroid values, and now we're going to relabel. So it doesn't matter whether this sample was called an A or a B or a C in the first round. Now we're just going to call it whatever it's closest to. If we, start, if we started our, uh, our, our clustering approach by saying we have three groups, we have a whole bunch of A's, B's, and C's, we're now throwing away those labels and saying, if you're closest to the centroid for A, you're now an A. If you're closest to the centroid for B, you're now a B. If you're closest to the centroid for C, you're now a C. Weird. But now, at least on the, on, in, in how these data are spread out, they kind of, it kind of looks more reasonable than the totally random labels we started with. But then, we, we repeat this. <clears throat> having having uh, picked centroids for the randomly labeled groups, we've now recategorized each, data, each sample to whatever centroid is closest, and now we recompute where the centroid is for that group. And again, we decide which group uh, a, a data point belongs to based on which centroid is closest. And we keep doing this until we reach uh, some, sort of, some point of convergence where the, the groups don't become more homogenous by adding another, another loop. Now remember, we had lots of different random starting points. We, we were going to do this 20 times, I think we said. So having created this cluster uh, for the first, the first iteration through, we're going to start all the way at the beginning with a random uh, assignment of members to groups. <clears throat> so 20 times we do this convergence until we finally have uh, one of those 20 groups that produce the, the most homogeneity within each cluster group. <clears throat> 
Weird. So why would something like that work? It works because it starts with lots of different random starts, which means that if you happen to have a random assignment that, doesn't, uh, that simply doesn't work at all, um, you're not trapped into it. And the next is this tuning process, this one where we uh, reassign labels and, and recompute centroids and then reassign labels and then recompute centroids and so on. So by having multiple starting points and by having this convergence, we get to clusters that, generally speaking, work okay in k-means. So the k in k-means says that you as a researcher must say how many groups you want, and the algorithm attempts to converge on that. All right. Now, uh, as we move ahead, let us talk about these dendrograms. Now, I showed you an example of those a couple back, these big branching figures that show, uh, in a, an agglomerate of cluster generally, how similar uh, all these different items uh, that we have are. So, first off, was there a question? Okay, cool. Um, what happens if I rotate a branch to the other orientation? Now, what on earth am I talking about? I'm going to drop back a couple slides. Okay. Now, as I'm looking at our dendrogram here, I see lots of different branch points. I have this branch point, this one, this one, and one all the way at the top. Everyone good with that? So those branch points are, uh, are sites that are flippable. Now, I, uh, I always have my badges on me, of course, and at the, at the top clip of my badge, I've got this little flipper. And if you're, if you're if you have sort of obsessive tend tendencies like I do, it probably bothers you whether you're wearing your name tag around in a way that shows the back or the front. Right? I sort of worry about this as I'm walking down the hall as someone trying to figure out who I am and they, they have no idea because I'm showing the back of the badge, right? So think of that. Think of these little hooks that we see in these dendrograms, each of those branch points as one of these little spinners, right? So, any time you're looking at a dendrogram, it's hard for me to think of any case where this is not true. Each of those branch points is flippable. It's flippable. So you might be tempted uh, to say that 1 and 5 are least like each other. That's what the cluster is telling you. You would be wrong, though, because in fact, each of those points is flippable. What happens if you flip this branch point right here? Suddenly, number one is next to number four. What happens if I flip this branch point as well? If I flip this and this, suddenly one is next to five in this row at the bottom. So rule number one about reading dendrograms is that you must always allow for the rotation of branch points. Many, many people in looking at these cluster diagrams do not take that into account, and, and so they, they erroneously think that, for example, these points are, right next, uh, uh, are as, as far apart from each other as they could be. Not true. Okay. Now, let us, let's continue back to the slide there. Okay. Are any of the branch points very close together? Now, we, in, in this case, we didn't really talk about how the the, the distances between branch points and the, the nodes or the, the distances between branch points are set. But you can imagine if you're doing something like a molecular evolution phylogeny that you could have these branch points actually quite close together. And in, the, in reality, that generally is a way of the software informing you that it's not sure which of them should be first. So you could imagine that the, the, the branch splits up or splits down either way. So if you, if you see that, it, it may be a sign that this is not, in fact, the unique hierarchy that could come from your data. It could be that if you rerun this 10 times, 60% of the time it's the other way. So, worth knowing. Uh, if, if, if the branch points are very close together in, within the, the, uh, the dendrogram, that's a good sign that there's some dubiousness about the ordering of those splits. All right, and what do the lengths of those arms mean? Well, now this, this is something where you, you find uh, a lot of curiosity. The most common dendrograms that we see over in our division come from people who are studying genetic diversity of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So they, they use the sequences to determine these distances between different samples. 
So if you see a, a very long branch, that might suggest to you that these two, uh, these two types of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis diverged tens of thousands of years ago. But the reality is that mutational information, genetic diversity information, is extremely hard to map accurately to years since the split. So things like how many years ago did humanity split from other primates is actually a point of some contention. You know, was it exactly 10 million years? Was it more than that? Was it less than that? Molecular clocks are difficult to calibrate. So uh, one of these things is that you should avoid over-interpretation on the lengths of these arms. Okay, and there was a, a really useful website. Uh, the, the Institute of Canine Biology had a, a useful examination of this point on how to evaluate, for example, the relationship among wolves and dogs and, and so on. So I've included the, the URL for that below. Okay. Now, I always like talking about the personalities behind our science. And in this case, I ran into this curious fellow named Tor E. Delanius. That name might, might seem uh, kind of curious to you. It, it's a Scandinavian name. He's from Sweden. Uh, and I found it really hard to dig up biographical information on this person. And it's interesting because he has a pretty serious claim to fame. He created in uh, 1950 something called SSQ clustering, or stratified sampling. He worked a lot with opinion surveys and, and demographic surveys, and he was uh, working on ways that you could cluster together uh, to stratify a sample into different groups. And all the way back in 1950, he created this SSQ technique that is in, in many ways prefigures what became k-means clustering. He had different ways of, of picking start points and picking uh, distances and so on. But this is all the way back in 1950, right after World War II he was doing, doing this kind of work. And I would point out that three years later, very rapid recognition, he was named a fellow of the American Statistical Association. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. But look, dude didn't even have his PhD yet. Four years after becoming a member of the American Statistical Association, he defended his PhD on sampling in Sweden, contributions to the methods and theories of sample survey practice. Now, that became a book because you know, some people have actually published their dissertations as books. I looked up the price on Amazon and it was, uh, it, to get a copy of that book is about $800, <laughs> all the way back from 1957. So having created clustering and having defended his work on uh, the statistical sampling question, he then went on to introduce this concept in 1977. Now, by this time I'm alive, right? I was born in 1973. So when I was four years old, he invented this concept of statistical disclosure control. His goal here was to evaluate uh, how much information was it okay to give away if somebody gets, gets hold of all of your research data. And he argued that someone should be able to know, uh, that someone shouldn't be able to learn more about a person just because that person discovers that that person was part of your study. This, this uh, focus on, on uh, participant privacy was a really new thing, and he wrote one of these seminal papers back in 1977 on that topic. Um, a couple years later, he introduced this concept of data swapping. So having collected a, uh, a, a great volume of, of data, uh, of survey uh, data, was it possible to modify, that, uh, modify those data so that it becomes even harder to associate a particular trait with a particular person in that, in that uh, study without destroying the statistical meaning of the data for that study? So that's quite a shift, right? Just 20 years after he's doing his PhD in something involving clustering, he suddenly got these ideas on, on patient privacy. So I, I think he's really somebody that we should, we should think of with some admiration. And yet, you'll find it very difficult to even find a Wikipedia page about him. I had to go hunting for quite a while to find this photo, which comes from uh, this, this paper, uh, uh, I believe in the 1970s. Uh, I, I contacted the university in Uppsala where he got his PhD, uh, and they pointed me to this, this PDF. So I thought that was really, rather kind. Another website provided his birth and death years, but I think this is a man that's, uh, that's due for a little celebration. Okay, so what did we take away from all of all this stuff today? It's not often that I, want to, that I want to send a torpedo 
through a major area of statistics, but I want you to be really cautious whenever you see a dendrogram. Clustering almost always involves many arbitrary decisions. You could choose between distance metrics. You could choose between linkage types. You could choose between agglomerative or divisive clustering to produce these clusters. No cluster should be considered the perfect, inarguable truth. In fact, if you were publishing a dendrogram, it would probably be a nice feature for your su uh, the supporting information for your manuscript to include some other dendrograms that were computed from exactly the same data. You will see that they differ, assuredly. When you know the number of different types that should exist in your data, k-means is a nice option. It's useful, it's extremely quick, with very large numbers of samples, and it's a very valuable tool for that purpose. It may help you to realize that some of your data fall on this boundary between groups. We're going to see some examples of that in the tutorial in just a moment. Always, always keep the rotation principle in mind when you're reading a dendrogram. Each of those branch points is a place that can swivel this way or that way. And the, if, if the diagram changes a lot in, in making that rotation, it's worth keeping in mind what they really represent. Okay? Now, from there, we're going to move on to uh, some demos. How much time have I left myself? Seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Oh, wait. All right. Well, we'll just do the best that we can uh, and leave things as they are. And I would start by saying that I borrowed a lot of this content from these Data Science Plus blog entries. The k-means clustering in R has a, a pretty good description written out along with the code uh, for this example. Uh, the hierarchical, uh, sorry, the, the k-means clustering and the hierarchical clustering posts were two different posts working, working from the same data set. So here I've, I've just followed that example. The code's not identical, but it's so similar as to be uh, indistinguishable. Um, I mentioned that I was going to show you the code that I used to show these distance metrics. Uh, you can see that that appears at the top of today's script. Uh, because of the time I've left myself, I'm going to skip that. Um, I would, however, point out that I had a, a little challenge here as I was trying to walk through. I'll pull this in a little bit. Okay. So I'm using a function called dist that we haven't used before, and the dist function is useful for finding the differences between all pairs of things. What I had done in this case was to make one big matrix of all of the, the red cluster and all of the black cluster put together so that it found distances between every two points, including points between, say, two black, uh, two, two black samples and two red samples. So here, I've had to subset it. I dump it into a matrix, and then I chop out the top and the right part of that distance matrix. So that's what this little business is here. I wanted to mention that because sometimes you, you must subset matrices. This example shows that we wanted to retain rows 6 through 10 and columns 1 through 5. This is a subset that I'm doing against that matrix. And then down at the bottom, you can see that I actually spell out what I'm, I'm trying to do. In the case of a complete linkage, I want to grab the maximum distance from that set. In the case of a single linkage, I want the minimum distance from that set. In the mean, uh, the mean distance, the mean linkage, I need to have the, the average distance between those. This centroid distance is computed differently. You can see that I'm squaring uh, centroid x differences, centroid y differences, adding them up, and then taking the square root. That's the, the Pythagorean theorem. So that's all about the distances. That's how I produce that figure. Down below, I see that uh, our k-means example is right here. Um, in this case, I am using the library ggplot2. So hopefully you've got that installed on your, your version of R. I'll come over here and run the library. There, it's installed. Uh, it's uh, in place now. I'm going to use the iris data set. Does everyone remember that? Petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width. OK, so we're going to grab those data. And we're just going to look at them to begin with. All right, and we see, uh, in this case, we are using just two, uh, two of the measurements, the pedal length and the pedal width, I believe, is the vertical. And we see that we have our setosa down here, 
we have Versicolor and Virginica up here. It should be apparent to you already that some aspects of this are easy to cluster. For example, this big gulf. And some of this is hard to cluster because this area has a conflation in petal lengths and petal widths. So this, is, this gray area, this blue-green area, is going to cause problems to clustering. OK, when I return to the code, I see that running k-means is pretty straightforward. I am providing k-means only two of the fields from the iris data set, just the pedal length and pedal width. I'm telling it that I'm dividing into three different clusters and that I want to start over 20 times. OK, so if I come back here to run this on the console, I need to pull that in a little bit so we can actually see the left edge of the screen. OK, so I run that and out blobs this, uh, this structure. So the clustering vector, if you remember, there are 50 different Satosis, 50 different uh, Virginicas, and 50 different, what was the other one? It's OK. There are three different ones. There are 50 of each. We see then that we have a vector, 150 long, that has a class label on it. So this is the cluster's judgment of whether each flower belongs to the, the first species, the second species, or the third species. This sum of squares is a really big deal, too. Now, we didn't talk about this a lot, but the software needs to have some criterion upon which it, uh, it judges whether it has done well or poorly. And what it's evaluating is the sum of squares from the central. We can figure out where the center of that cluster is, and if the data points are all very far from that centroid, it worries about it a bit. If the, if the data points are quite close to the centroid, it feels better about it. So it's trying to minimize this sum of squares as well. OK, so this is just the object that came back. There are some handier ways to visualize it, though. So we're going to start by just asking, when we look at how, the, how those cluster assignments associate with this, oh, versicolor is the other, that's right. So these three labels were never provided to k-means. k-means did not get it. It just got pedal length and pedal width. We see that there, there should be 50 of each of these. Cluster 1 is all of the setosis. So that's really great. That's a perfect score for the, the points way down at the, near the origin. Versicolor and Virginica were more problematic, though. Here we see that there were 50 uh, called Versicolor uh, in, the, in the labels, and yet two of them were misclassified as Cluster 3. The Virginicas Almost all of them were in cluster 3, but four of them were misassigned to cluster 2. Now, we would like to visualize this to see where these missed calls are. And for that, we're going to use some kind of nasty-looking ggplot code, but it's going to be OK, really. I'm just going to run it at the moment, and we'll, we'll feel good about it. OK, so I've now run that code. I pop over here to the graphics device, and now we see that the setosas that are called cluster 1 appear as black dots in gray circles. So we feel really good about that. Are there any gray circles outside this lump down here? No. So that's all grand. But we don't have a perfect overlap in the, red, uh, the large red circles and the small red dots. These are correct calls, and some of them lie right on top of each other, which is why they're darker. But way out here, we see that some of these were actually um, were, were called versicolors when they were actually uh, uh, virginicas. So when we see a color mismatch, that's telling us that the reality is X and the call was Y. So this gray zone ended up being a problem within the k-means clustering. It's not a perfect separation. Is it a bad separation? It's not bad. Not bad. OK. Now, I'm going to do this, the same kind of clustering, this time with the agglomerative clustering. Um, we're using the hclust function. I, I sort of glommed this all together, I'm afraid. So we're feeding it the pedal lengths and pedal widths again. It is computing distances um, by, sorry, the, the distances here are being computed by Euclidean distance. That's just the default behavior. And the hclust function reads in those distances and performs a complete linkage, agglomerative cluster on it. 
So I realize there's a, there's a lot to that line. I probably would have split that up if I'd spent some time thinking about it. So um, then we can plot the cluster that comes out of it. All right, so we've created our plot. What does it look like? Aha, there's our dendrogram. So that didn't take a lot of lines of code at all, did it? So the dendrogram falls right out of this. Now, in this case, the length of these lines gives us some information. So if you see a, uh, a really big, uh, long vertical, that gives us some confidence that this subset is pretty far away from anything that isn't inside it. So uh, we see that our data split into two clusters or four clusters. Which would you go with? Well, we know there are actually three clusters. So the, the correct answer for where the, the boundary should be set is right here. But the software is finding it very difficult to dis distinguish between two clusters and four. So that's, that's not a great, a great moment for the software. But that, as we've said, is just one way to plot it. Let us find another. Uh, all right. We now uh, want to ask, how do, if we inform, uh, if we cut this tree in a way that gives us three clusters, what does the result look like? All right, I'm going to make that scenario. Okay. Okay, so now I've forced that tree to be chopped into a way that gives us three clusters. We're now, we're now giving it the information that there are really three. And we see that Setosa is perfectly uh, grouped together. The Versicolor is a mess. Look at that, 21 and 29. It could not decide whether the Versicolor should be cluster 2 or cluster 3. That's not great news. Virginica is doing great on it, but this Versicolor set is really pitching a fit, so we're not happy with that. I come back over here. Uh, let's change the linkage. Remember, we get to make some arbitrary decisions. This is clustering, and clustering is dirty. So we're going to change the linkage strategy, not the distance metrics, we're just going to stick with Euclidean, but we're going to change to a linkage measurement as a way to create our cluster. And let us see if things get in any better. OK, how do we assess this? We have a, a dendrogram here. We see a really long distance separating these from all of those. So think of these as all the setosas getting glommed together right away. That's grand. The rest of the data are fitting into this large, ambiguous group that gets split this way and that. Let us see if, if this new approach gives us any better assessment uh, when we compare to the reality. Glom cut to three. Stick that into the table. All right. There we go. So now having cut to three, we see that once again the setosas are all together. The versicolors are mostly in cluster two now, and the virginicas are mostly in cluster three. But we actually lost our discrimination on virginica because virginica was all in one group before, and now we have one that's sliding over into, the, into this cluster with the, all, almost all of the versicolors. So it was a, a trade-off. We, we diminished our ability to keep the virginicas grouped together, but we have a much better ability to keep versicolors together than we had before. This is a win, I think. So by altering the linkage, or by altering the way we compute distances, you may make a very different uh, cluster di diagram as a result. All right, now let us plot how we do. So we're going to pull open the, the ggplot function again, replot, and what, what magic comes out of it. So before, we used k means and k means came up with a pretty good separation into three categories. Here, we are doing an agglomerative. We're building up our clusters from below, a bottom-up approach. And we see that the virginica, sorry, the setosas are all clustered together appropriately. The judgment uh, reflects the reality very well. But once again, just a few of these on the boundary between setosa, uh, sorry, between virginica and versicolor cause some problems for this classification. So I hope that the demo, although it was very fast, I know, um, gives you some idea of how arbitrary some of these decisions may be and how big an impact they could have on the cluster that comes out of it. Don't simply run the cluster one way and assume that that's what it's always going to look like no matter what decisions you make. In fact, you'll find that 
your decisions about which settings you use will have all kinds of impact on the resulting image. Okay? So next week we're back here. Uh, we'll be talking about multiple testing correction. I know I've been talking about uh, doing that lecture next week, next week, but next week it's really going to happen. I'm, I'm really looking forward to discussing it with you. And uh, in the meanwhile, have an excellent week. Thank you.